I'm Wendy Hartsock, science and peptide enthusiast. In this episode of Exploration Science, Jennifer Heemstra, chair and professor of chemistry at Washington University in St. Louis, talks about her exploration of molecular diversity with peptide nucleic acids, and also dives into ideas and initiatives to drive diversity in science. Maybe we could just start with um, telling me what your, like your current research projects are. So in our lab, we have a really diverse range of research projects, and that's a little bit because of what drives all of the work that we do, that we're not so much focused on a specific system or a specific technique, but rather we are inspired by supermolecular chemistry. So we love building with molecules and we think that biomolecules, nucleic acids and proteins and peptides are basically the coolest building bricks ever for um, building functional systems. And so uh, the way that we approach science is to just look outward and say, where is there an unmet need? Usually in biomedicine or the environment, and then we dig into, we have a really interdisciplinary team and we dig into our figurative box of biomolecular Lego bricks and think about how we can build a system in order to address that need. And then we design and build and test and fail and redesign and rebuild and retest and often fail again. Um, but we're focused not only on being able to invent new technologies that can benefit researchers or society, but also learning through those failures about how molecules interact because usually when something fails or often when it fails it's because molecules don't interact in the ways that we expected them to and so at least some of the time in those failures there's an opportunity to say oh wow this this molecule isn't doing what i thought it was doing let's dig in and learn a little bit more about that and so we we care both about adding to fundamental knowledge and inventing new technologies yes. That's awesome. Yeah, I think that's such a good point to to accept failure and not, not just accept it, but actually embrace failure because you're right, that is sometimes where you make the most interesting discoveries. And so when something doesn't go the way that you, you know, when your null hypothesis <laughs> ends up happening, you you should figure out why. And and yeah, you might find something, like you said, very surprising um, and, and following that. I mean, I think that that's such a, a great attitude. Um, Tell me it doesn't make failure any less difficult. So I will say for all any grad students, I think we both know that for any grad students out yeah. there, any early career researchers, you know, when you're facing failure, it doesn't make it any less challenging. But certainly, you know, many of our most important discoveries have come out of something that hasn't worked or, or there have been times when a failure of a, a project has actually taken us in a whole new direction that led to a, a whole new project area for us. Yes. Yeah, definitely. No, I think that when I was writing my thesis up, you know, I was like, I could, I could write an 800 page thesis if I had all my failures in there. <laughs> right? And we should allow that. It, it should be out there somewhere. I think that's somewhere that um, science could really do some evolving is to, I, to think about ways to make a thesis more authentically yours. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought about, you know, doing that and then titling it, what doesn't work, you know? Yes, I mean, <laughs> all of the things that don't work. And actually, yeah. that's something where I'm really excited about some of the new journals that are emerging mm -hmm. that allow people, I know that, you know, there are some journals like PLOS One who've been doing this for quite a while, but with ACS Omega also being on the scene, we recently published a paper there where for one of our experiments, it didn't, or maybe I think it's actually in the like later stages of review and hopefully getting published soon, but we submitted a paper there where some things worked, didn't work quite as well as we hoped. And then one of the things that we were most excited about actually didn't work. We thought this is really important for other people to know because we wouldn't want them to spend a lot of time trying to do this exact thing only to find that it, it doesn't work for them either. And we actually wrote that in the paper. We included all of it and said, especially given the aims of this journal, we wanted to tell this story, even though it ultimately didn't give us the results we hoped for. And what was so encouraging is that at least one reviewer came back and noted that they they appreciated that. And they said, this is, this is great and we should be doing this. And so I, I think we need 
more and more opportunities to do that. And I'm really hopeful actually that having things like Chem Archive and BioArchive, having these preprint servers is just another avenue by which we can share those things that didn't work. Yeah, absolutely. I think that and, you know, some, a, a couple of things along those lines, when I was uh, writing up some stuff with, again, in, in my PhD, you know, really writing when, um, like, I was working with these linkers that had azides on them, and they were fairly small linkers. And so just being cognizant to, to explain to people, like, hey, if you're working on this, it's small, like, this is explosive. So, you know, please be careful. And, and so, like, along all those lines, the other thing I found when I was at Faring Pharmaceuticals was that we would, so we would go in the literature to find interesting, you know, chemistries that we could uh, take into to, uh, maybe a drug discovery project. But uh, oftentimes, and I think this is, this is true across all the sciences, you go to reproduce uh, finding and you, and you can't. Yeah. And so it would be nice if we could also kind of get together, I think, and talk more about, so sharing failures and sharing you know, when we can and can't reproduce something, but then collaborating on it, not being like, we can't reproduce your Yes. Work. <laughs> that would be amazing. I, I would love to see more ways to do that. You know, one model that actually my spouse participated in is a graduate student. And, and it's, it's great. It's so labor intensive, though. It's so costly. We couldn't do it for everything. But looking back at the orgs and preps, right, that if you want to publish an orgs and prep, then there's another lab that takes your protocol and tests it out. And it's, you know, rigor is down to like, if you get, you know, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but like a couple percent off on yield, then there needs to be a conversation. But the thing, at least that I got to see in, in that process is that it, it can be a dialogue of, okay, well, what, what happened and comparing and, but the product then is something that, you know is going to work yeah. you know i mean that takes peer review to the next level but it's it's so interesting though one of my neighbors is in electrical engineering and computer science and we were out biking and he we were talking about publication and um and he's the chair of the department there and, and so we we're talking about publications and, and tenure cases and how many publications you need for tenure and we realized and just the process of that that they actually present their work at a conference before they publish it. So they present like the peer review kind of happens at a conference. And that's a, a really interesting difference that I know is you know, the, the norm in many fields. And I think it's, it's a super interesting model, but also what came out is that in their field, in his field, when people publish, the peer review process, like people actually replicate your work, especially the mathematical modeling mm -hmm. and things like that. And I just realized like, wow, we could never, it would be so hard to do that in chemistry, but it, it's a really interesting right. model to think about of, right. you know, maybe are there small pieces or, or places where we could do yeah. that in order yeah. to increase the rigor of our science. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are a lot of possibilities there. Like you said, even in small part, like, so if someone is doing an experiment and they're using a publication, let you know have a, have a community that says hey i tried to reproduce this and i and i'm not getting it what and i know obviously you can reach out to the authors and whatnot but but it'd almost be nice if like there was a central location to do that that was again like yeah. you know there were cheerleaders to say yes let us know let us know we want to we want to figure this out we want it to be the most rigorous possible but yeah. uh, and, and if know. there were reward structure you know sure. everything i you know you probably see this too that if we want to change the way we do science we have to change the reward structure that drives it. And so it would have to be that there was some reward then for authors who did the original work to go back in and say, oh, right. thank you for letting us know. And now we're going to look into this and do a follow-up publication with more information yeah. or yeah. whatever it takes. But right. then that, that would have to be rewarded in some way, you know, on, on the academic side, it, it would be right. that has to be rewarded by funding agencies or in tenure and promotion reviews, yeah. because then it's something that would, that would really happen. Right. You know, so, um, and we, we, I promise we will talk about PNAs because I'm super interested, but you brought up something else that I've always found, um, I guess, uh, difficult to reconcile, and that is the, the tenure process and the, you know, need for number of publications, not necessarily 
quality versus quantity or looking at a person as a whole. And, and let me just preface the rest of the question with um, one of the episodes that's going to be coming out that was recorded by my co-host is on the non-science of the GRE and how that limits diversity in, in graduate yes. school recruitment and retention. When you're looking at the tenure process, when you start doing, you know, saying like you have to have X number of publications, do you see that as somehow influencing the ability to, to recruit and retain diverse faculty or just maybe your thoughts in general on, on that? Oh, yes. I have so many thoughts about this. I have to say that what I'm about to say are my own personal thoughts and don't represent the official stance of my department or my university. I feel this all the more acutely now as a department chair that, you know, I don't want anyone listening to this, uh, especially as a member of my department to think, oh, no, that's Jen's uh, stance. It's you're just my personal stance on it by myself is actually with tenure and with graduate admissions and faculty hiring, with all of these things that we do, we need to create more avenues for excellence and we need to evaluate each person in context. Mm -hmm. And so to break down each of those things, you're creating more avenues for excellence is the realization that there are a lot of important ways that people can contribute as a graduate student, as a faculty member. And in fact, one of the most frustrating things as a group leader in academia is that I can read the leadership literature. I do this often because I have a lot to learn from it. And there are many parallels between the business world and academia, but one of the places where there's a huge, huge difference is you'll read the leadership literature and they say each, you know, take your team and look at each person's individual abilities and skills and interests and then match their job duties to that. And I'm like, I wish I could do that. I wish I could say, okay, this one person in the lab, you're maintaining all the equipment. This one person, you're writing all the manuscripts. You, you're mentoring all of the, the new graduate students who come in because that's what you each really love doing and are really good at. But of course we can't do that because every graduate student has to you know, do research and publish papers and do all of these things to be successful. I would be a terrible mentor to the members of my lab if I divided up responsibilities like that. And so instead we have to, because of the reward structure that people encounter later on, we have to kind of shoehorn people into a set of responsibilities that are not necessarily aligned with their strengths and interests. And I think the system is changing a lot in that as, as more job, more career pathways are becoming publicized and there's more awareness of all of the different career pathways you can pursue with a degree in chemistry and that not all of those rely on having a huge number of high impact papers. Some of them you can get with no research papers at all. It has certainly improved the situation and provided more flexibility for um, early career researchers to approach their graduate career uh, with a focus on what is in their best interest of their professional development and their goals, but we're still not totally there yet. And I think that uh, we still have a long way to go to bring this into the faculty career, to say that there are so many ways that individuals can contribute to a department and to helping a department realize our goals, and that it would be amazing if we could create more flexibility in the evaluation process to recognize all of those different contributions. Um, and then that directly ties in with the diversity argument because, you know, the, the, in the absence of valuing all these different ways of contributing, really the default becomes what worked for the people who were here 50 or 100 years ago, right? And if you look at the people who are here 50 or 100 years ago, uh, there is basically almost no diversity. It is almost exclusively straight white men who then largely had partners, spouses who stayed at home and did all of the domestic work. And so we're now, uh, um, you know, creating a much more diverse faculty nationwide, but we're still burdened by these metrics that were created for people who are no longer, you know, exclusively who are right. in faculty positions. And I think even for, you know, people in the majority group, for straight white men in faculty positions right now, um, the game has changed too. You know, many of them are 
you know, supporting a partner um, and doing childcare and doing domestic, you know, it's just not working for, I would argue is not working for anyone. I think the old metric system from a hundred years ago is not working for ever anyone. And especially for people who have been historically underrepresented among chemistry faculty. Um, and as we work to change things, we need to recognize that not everyone has the same opportunity for success. That if you become, you, know, you asked specifically about tenure promotion, but this certainly, um, is the case for graduate students and postdocs too, that if you are from a group that is underrepresented at your career stage, like if there are you know, not an equal representative amount of people who share your identities, um, its success can be much harder in part because then you're more likely to have to do work to improve the climate to you know serve on a dei committee or be putting time into those efforts um if there's more diversity at the student level than at the faculty level then faculty from those underrepresented groups have are mentoring a larger number of students who want to have a mentor who reflects their identities and you're just going to encounter more nonsense more yeah. off you know inappropriate comments more hostility more stereotype threat, all of those things. And all of those things together make it more challenging to be successful. And so until we have perfectly just society and perfectly just academic systems where every single person can have an equal opportunity for success, I think we have to be looking at reviews, especially these really critical reviews, in context and looking at the context in which someone has had to perform that work over the last, you know, five or six or seven or whatever years and think about that as part of evaluating excellence. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I, I clearly have a lot to say on that. I know. And I have a ton of ideas from, from listening to you and from and speaking with you. And I would, I would like to follow up for sure this conversation with like things, like just things that we can think of, different models that just to throw out in space and see if any of them seem like they could catch because you're right. I mean, and, and I'll segue into sort of, you know, back into the science of, of molecular diversity, but, but it, mm. it, it, it's volumes, right? That, that diversity is important everywhere. So, so not just in, in the people that were around, but in their ideas yes. and in molecules that can be used for a variety of applications, which is a great way to start talking about bilingual <laughs> <laughs> molecules <laughs> based on PNAs. So could you maybe just tell me a little bit about what, how did you get first interested in PNAs? Like, where were you like that molecule? Oh, man, it actually goes back to my postdoc work that when I was a postdoctoral researcher, um, the lab that I was working in, David Liu's lab, was doing a bit of research with peptide nucleic acids, with PNA. And as someone who was approaching the field of chemical biology then with this super molecular lens, you know, basically my, my trajectory was as an undergraduate, I actually worked on peptides as an undergraduate uh, with, with Professor James Nowick, who is uh, very well known in the peptide community. It was a phenomenal mentor. And when I was choosing a lab, I remember, you know, I, I tell students now, I'm like, you know, you went to the pages, but they weren't like web pages. They were literally like pages, you know, <laughs> on the wall of, for each professor and a little one page research description. And I looked over all of them. And when I saw his research, there was something about it. It's like, I don't, I can't put my finger on it, but this is just so cool. This is so fun. And by the end of my time as an undergrad, when I was heading off to grad school, I had the word super molecular chemistry. I was like, I am fascinated by molecular recognition and self-assembly. I like to build with molecules, right? And designs engineering on the molecular scale. And then throughout my PhD work, I had a lot of fun um, working with organic polymers, but really developed this appreciation for what biomolecules can do and what nucleic acids can do. And then that's what drew me into this postdoc in David Liu's lab and made me really so excited to be able to have the opportunity to go there. And so when I learned about peptide nucleic acids, the thing that really struck me is to have a 
chemical system that has the molecular recognition properties of a nucleic acid, the ability to just design, you know, I would say nucleic acids are the only type of molecule where it's absolutely trivial to design two molecules that can selectively find and bind to one another and that you can just you know, do this with any sequence. You can sit down and type out a random string of A, T, C, and G, right. make the complement to that, and you know that when you put those two together, there's a really good chance they're going to bind to each other. So seeing a molecule that had that type of programmable molecular recognition, but because it's built from this amino acid-like, this peptide-like backbone, and we synthesize them in the lab, the ability to chemically tailor that backbone in order to add in extra layers of recognition or extra function or extra reactivity handles the the possibilities were just so much greater than what you could do with native nucleic acids you know tailoring the backbone of dna or rna is really really challenging as we found out by doing some of that research as well there's a lot of cool stuff you can do but with peptide nucleic acids the opportunities just seem so much greater and so it, it seemed like, wow, this is just a really, really neat scaffold mm -hmm. that we can explore. And right. I'm, you know, and, and then the ideas just started coming with what we could do with this, you know, what, what I was excited to do in my postdoc, but then in our independent, when I started my independent career, our lab just kept coming back to, wow, these are really cool molecules and, mm -hmm. and there's things we can do here. And can you so describe the, the, the basic structure of a PNA and then talk about taking that and transforming it into these, these bilingual molecules yes. that you know, yeah, are working on? Yes. Yeah, so a PNA is a nucleic acid, peptide nucleic acid. And these were first reported in 1992 by uh, Eggholm, Buckhart, Nielsen, and Berg in a JAX paper. Um, and they first reported a sequence that's like a poly T that combined to a poly A. And then later they reported that these could be sequence specific. That you can have that mix of A, T, C, and G, and they will still find and bind to DNA and RNA. So they're um, they're exactly what their name sounds like, which I, I always love it in biology when things are exactly what the name says, in that they are nucleic acids, in that they are a polymer that has nucleobases arrayed on it, A, T, C, and G, or whatever other artificial nucleobases you want to put. Um, but that is built onto a peptide-like backbone. So it's um, an amino ethyl glycine. And so it's essentially a one amino acid unit, which is typically glycine, and then an ethylene diamine. So think about a dipeptide, but with one carbonyl missing. Um, and then the nucleobase hangs off of the nitrogen that is in the middle of that dipeptide. And these have phenomenal binding properties with DNA and RNA, in part because the, the structure of that peptide-like backbone actually creates a hydrogen bond between one of the carbonyls and a, an NH further down, and that pre-organizes the PNA into a helical structure that makes it easier to bind to DNA and RNA. So they not only bind sequence specifically with DNA and RNA, but they actually bind more tightly with DNA and RNA than DNA and RNA do with themselves. And there's um, you know, kind of a longstanding debate about the role of electrostatics. And actually that's where we got into this is that um, electrostatics are not actually as important as, um, you know, I think it had been maybe hypothesized and, you know, you can put negative charge on PNA and it really doesn't take away very much of the affinity. And actually, you know, on the flip side, you can put positive charge on and it, it also doesn't impact it so much. It's really that pre-organization that seems to be the dominant thing that drives most of that gain that you see in affinity. And it's more nuanced than that, but, um, but to an approximation, it's that the electrostatics are not, not super important. Um, but what's uh, really cool and what was happening, so over the PNAs were first reported in 1992, and then there was just this amazing time of people exploring all different types of backbone structures. So can we put, uh, you know, cyclic rings in there? Can we put amino acid side chains into the backbone? And some of these things, you know, kind of mess up that pre-organization. And so it has a negative impact, but some of them actually support pre-organization. And one of those modifications is that if you have an L-amino acid at the alpha position, so um, 
actually at the first carbon of the ethylene diamine, then that actually is very positive for binding because that uh, the sterics actually further reinforce pre-organization into the correct handedness to bind to naturally occurring D, DNA, and RNA. And so a lot of really gorgeous work had been done with then putting, say, positively charged arginine groups into PNA to promote cellular uptake or putting amino ethyl or sorry, uh, short peg groups on to increase solubility. And we came into this field um, actually from a different angle in that a proposal, well, I, I decided really late to apply for faculty jobs, like a month before applications were due, because I had been wrangling my self-doubt and, you know, I had had a baby and, and like didn't think I could be a faculty member. And so all of these things kind of conspired to make me think I couldn't be a faculty member and I could never apply for jobs. And at the last minute, I was like, I got to go for this. But I also needed proposals. And so in that moment, this, this is like, yeah, we're backtracking to 2000, 2010, 2009. But in that moment, I was like, I need proposals. And I went back and I, I had a couple of ideas. And then I dug up the one that I wrote in grad school and uh, for my fourth year grad student proposal. And I remember for any grad students out there listening, I wrote this thing. And then as a faculty, you know, applying for faculty jobs, I was like, oh, I remember that was pretty good. I'll just, you know, reuse that. And then I, I opened it up and I was like, oh man, this is, I, I have grown so much since then, but I, I edited it up. And what that proposal was for is uh, these DNA cross-linked micelles. And it was the idea that if you had DNA attached to a hydrophobic polymer, those should assemble into kind of micelles because they're amphiphilic, you have hydrophobic core and hydrophilic DNA on the outside. They should be basically like soaps, but if you have multiple DNA strands on each monomer and they're complementary, you have two complementary sequences, you should be able to cross-link them. And so you should be able to alter the stability of these micelles by either, you know, cleaving off the DNA or by, un, you know, adding in a complementary sequence that breaks up the cross-links. Um, and it was, kind of this programmable materials. And um, thankfully that and a couple of other proposals got me a job and we actually got funded for that work as our first grant that got funded. And we found that this idea worked, but the, the challenge is that no matter what you did out in the DNA portion, these molecules are still really, really, really amphiphilic. And so the, the realization we had is, wow, we really need to be able to change both the hydrophobic part and the hydrophilic part. But the hydrophobic part is just this like organic polymer and that's not very information rich. And so we're really limited there. And so there was a point a few years ago where we had been doing, continuing to do work in PNA and thinking about what sort of side chains can you put on PNA and still have it bind well. And then we were working on this amphiphiles project and saying, gosh, I wish we had a way to have an information rich hydrophilic and hydrophobic portion. And the light bulb just went off for our lab to say, oh, people can put side chains in PNA. They've been doing this to increase cellular uptake or increase solubility. What if we did this to encode things like amphiphilicity? And now we have this polymer where we can make part of it hydrophobic, make part of it hydrophilic, but the entire thing can do watson crick franklin based pairing. So all of it can be addressed. We can change that, you know, the hydrophobicity of any portion of this. And, and then we really, you know, that morphed into this broader view of where we want to go in the future, which is, wow, we can, you know, we can encode information to two information codes, two languages into this polymer. We can make it speak nucleic acid and we can make it speak peptide and it can potentially be a go-between for these two information codes in nature. And so where we want to go is to embed more complex information codes, you know, beyond amphiphiles that drive self-assembly to things that could actually interact with proteins or other peptides in a really specific way and be able to make adapters or switches that we could send into biological systems to be mediating interactions, kind of, you know, like a translator mediating interactions between these two biopolymer languages. Right. Wow. Oh. And can you talk a little bit about the current um, monomers that you're using? Because they do have a special functionalization where you can display the, the side chains. Yeah. So the, the synthesis that we use is synthesis that's been reported in the literature by 
Danapella and by Janet Lai and many others. So um, I give the the people who have been the giants of this field all of the credit for that. And so we um, really were not very limited. So anything that you can buy or make as an amino acid, you can incorporate into a PNA if it's compatible with solid phase peptide synthesis. Um, you know, we do, it's a pretty standard synthesis where you take an amino acid, since it's going to be in the ethylene diamine part, we um, basically take it down to, uh, well, an alcohol, and then we oxidize it back up to an aldehyde, do a reductive amination with the glycine, or we could do a functionalized amino acid there too, and have two side chains in one monomer. And then you couple on the, the nuclear base, and then you're basically making these as FMOC or Bach protected amino acids, just with an extended backbone, extra nucleobase, and all the protecting groups that come with it. So I, I, I make it sound trivial, but because, uh, you know, in honor of the people who do this work in, in our lab and others, I will say it is definitely not trivial. It's a known synthesis, but doesn't mean it's an easy synthesis. And there's, there's a ton of work that goes into generating these monomers, but then once we have them, yeah, we can throw them onto it. We have a peptide synthesizer and we, we put them onto the peptide synthesizer and we can make PNA oligomers just as you would a peptide. Very cool. So you did mention um, sort of protein um, you know, targets within cells, um, but also I would suspect that you could target RNA, DNA, and, and actually like engage other proteins to come over and other molecules to come over using the amino acid structures. So are you... And a plane in that space. Yes. 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 Yeah. So that's exactly what where we hope to go with this is I, I think of it like an artificial transcription factor. Mm -hmm. Yes. In that if you could specifically, one of the other cool things about PNAs is that Eric Rosner has done beautiful work in this area, and again, many others, that if you can specific because you have this high affinity you can specifically invade double-stranded tracts of nucleic acids, which is a really tough thing to do. And so you can get into invading double-stranded DNA. And so if we could have a PNA that can go and target a very specific place in DNA, and then because of the amino acid sequence that's there, that that then recruits another protein to that place. That's a really exciting goal. Like kind of the advanced level of what we'd like to be able to do is have um, a PNA where the amino acids, when it's just in its random coil conformation, don't have particularly high affinity to the protein target. But once you get locked down into the double helix, then you have everything dialed in for optimal affinity. And so you can get that uh, entropic benefit that can drive a stronger interaction. So that's, that's uh, in my dream science world, we would be able to design such things. And in reality, we have a ways to go to understand what it would take to do that. And yeah. we need to be engaging more with computational tools and collaborators in order to be able to get there. All right, nice. Yeah, so I will mention, I used to work um, in the field of zinc fingers. So my master's, uh, my, my advisor was David Siegel, and, and he was working on these zinc finger chimeras that were like zinc fingers and nucleases. Um, which Sigma now yes. sells like their own version of that. But yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's almost as address. Yeah. That's about as close as you get to a really, really beautiful addressable system of protein. So I will give credit. I, I talk of nucleic acids and their molecular recognition capabilities, but zinc fingers are, and many other things, talons are, are really phenomenal as well. Right. But what's cool about, I guess, the having those, you know, the peptide nucleic acid and having that nucleic acid recognition capability is being able to target so many types of nucleic acids, like regardless of what they look like in the cell. So again, whether it's single stranded or double stranded or mRNA or DNA, or I mean, and, and even exogenous, you know, nucleic acids. I mean, there, there's so, even, I was thinking as, as I was reading your publications, um, you know, like G quadruplexes, things where like, you know, these other uh, uh, secondary structures of RNA and DNA that you could actually yeah. do because now you have the capability to change the way that the, the um, nucleic acids are displayed in a, in a peptide scaffold. I mean, it's just cool. Like, yeah. Yeah. And there's some beautiful work out there too on targeting uh, G quadruplexes with PNAs. There's, it's the PNA field is this um, really phenomenal field of just great people who, mm -hmm. who keep pushing things ahead. Right. Yeah. Have you seen, cause I was kind of looking at the publications and, 
So it was like in the, you know, like when you go to like the PubMed, you can see like the, the number of publications per year. And so it looked like 2017 was like, boom. And then it kind of felt, are you seeing yeah. it? It's like, t tell me what, because again, I'm not in the field. So I, you know, I'm this like outsider looking in, so. Yeah, I think it, the p and field gained pretty steady momentum from the first discovery as people thought about chemical modifications. And I, I think any field you have ups and downs yes. that, oh, we could get into, we won't get into this topic, but the ups and downs that are driven by federal funding and as things yes. come in and out of style and as everyone says, oh no, no, that problem is already solved with this other thing. And then you rebound into, oh, never mind that that solution yeah. actually is more complicated than we thought. And now going back to these previous options seems feasible. I see this, we work in the aftermer field and you see that constant tug of war of people saying, oh, no, no, we don't need aftermers because we've got antibodies and antibodies solve all of our problems. And then people use antibodies being like, no, antibodies have, you know, cause all of our problems, you know, not fully, but, uh, you know, and boy, aftermers seem amazing. And then other people say, oh, no, no, aftermers have their own challenges. So there's this constant kind of back and forth that exists in the federal funding system. And it's one of the big challenges to doing academic research because you're constantly having to navigate that. And it's like, no, we just want to do the research that we're doing and keep making progress, but we have to live in this ecosystem of constantly adapting as well. And so I think some areas of research do, you know, ebb and flow. And mm -hmm. I, I imagine, I know that that happens in the US, it, it likely happens in other countries as well possibly in different ways and on different timescales. But I would say that, that that could be something that drives a lot of the back and forth of, you know, are, is nucleic acid therapeutics going to go down an antisense pathway or is it going to be an siRNA pathway, right? There's, yeah. there's benefits to both of those. And I think we don't have enough nucleic acid therapeutics out there to really call that a solved issue. Yeah. Well, and I always worry when, when any entity decides that one, um, you know, molecular class is the, is the way to go. Uh, I get it though. I mean, obviously you have like a certain pot of money and you have to figure out where should it go. But I think, yeah, like being open to understand that there's not one modality that will work. There are many modalities and they will work sometimes and they will not sometimes. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, one positive change I'd say that is in this field, you know, touches on the field of chemical biology in academia is the changes in, well, I, I'll say it's positive in this aspect. It, it has benefits and limitations, but the NIH has increasingly gone to this R35 or MIRA mechanism. Yeah. And this is supposed to be, it, it replaces, um, so it, within NIGMS, so most of the um, or I, I want to back up and say uh, NIGMS, uh, the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, is one of the key institutes that funds research in the peptide field and the chemical biology field more broadly because they're devoted to basic biomedical science. It doesn't have to be aimed at a specific disease or a specific organ or a specific population. And certainly we can draw from all of the other institutes as well when we do disease specific work. But often um, your NIGMS funding is, is really for your core basic science projects that you have going in the lab. And one of the changes that's happened uh, over the last about five, six years now is the introduction of this new funding mechanism, where instead of applying for as many grants as you can get within NIGMS and trying to have multiple RO1s, which are, you know, the million, million and a half dollar grants, and, and then trying to get things like R21s and, and other smaller grants, you just apply for this one, it's basically a block grant. You apply for a block grant um, that's five years long, and it's less money than you could probably get if you applied for lots of different things. But it also means you only have to write one application every five years and one progress report every year. And so it's supposed to bring more stability to investigators. 
Um, and there's, you know, again, some limitations with that of all of a sudden you want to start a new collaboration with someone, yeah. but you can't get more money for that collaboration. It, it, it has some challenges, but on the very, very positive side, there's a lot more flexibility and freedom with the research. It's, it doesn't have the ideas. You don't have these specific aims where, oh, okay, I have to do exactly what I said in aim one, exactly what I said in aim two. It's really to fund investigators for their research program. And it allows you to be more agile to say, oh, we realize an opportunity here and we want to move this project in this direction or that direction. Or, you know, we think that this still has a lot of promise and we're going to keep going down this path. Um, the other really promising thing with that mechanism is that at least for coming back to our earlier conversation about reward structure for early stage investigators, the, um, I don't want to misquote this so everyone can disclaimer, I do not work for the NIH and go read up on the NIH's you know, official stance on MIRA, but it's, it's somewhere in the, the review criteria, um, the quality of mentoring or your plan to provide high quality mentoring to the researchers in your lab, to students and postdocs in your group, that that is now a scorable criteria. And my personal hope is that that becomes a scorable criteria for all investigators, because really, yes, this money is to do science, but this money is also really what drives our STEM workforce development. Okay. That when you think about how do people get PhDs, they get PhDs because federal agencies fund research at academic institutions, and we need to be accountable to both doing high quality research, but also providing high quality mentoring to the individuals who are a future STEM workforce. And so it's been really exciting to see that change. And I think that that's a really positive indicator of rewarding, um, rewarding things beyond, you know, there's, there's lots of rewards for research and there need to be continue to be so, but the, the National Academies report basically says, you know, we need to, if we want better mentoring, we need to reward it. And so, building that into the reward structure at the level of funding, I think is a really promising path. Well, and that's a positive feedback, isn't it? Because like a loop, right? So yes. mentor, you get better scientists, you get better science, mentor, you get, I mean, it's, it, it will feed back into each other. So it only makes sense. Yes. And in fact, if you'll allow me to plug this, uh, based on that exact conversation idea, um, Neil Garg at UCLA and I collaborated to create an initiative called Mentor First. And it's, it's based I, on exactly that idea. I was like on my thing. I was like, I have it written down. We have to talk about mentorfirst.org. Yes. So yes, please tell me all about okay. that. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so mentor, thank you for the opportunity. I'm, I'm so glad that was on your list. So it, it really came out of exactly that conversation of mentoring and research are both important. And too often the conversation views these as a zero sum game that, oh, if you care a lot about mentoring, you must not care about research. Or if you want to do the best research, you can't possibly be a good mentor. And it's like, no, no, you can have both. And in fact, as you so beautifully pointed out, they are mutually reinforcing, but it matters which we put first. If you put research first, then good mentoring is not uh, necessarily going to become an automatic outcome. And in fact, you know, usually it doesn't. But if you put mentoring first and you, you invest in helping every single person that you work with to be their best every single day and provide the environment where people can thrive and where people can excel, then the outcome of that is going to be better research. If you have a lab where people feel supported, where they collaborate, where they talk openly, then, and you are, you know, creating high standards for innovation and productivity, but doing so in a way that is supportive and reasonable and helps everyone achieve at their best, then good research is going to be the nat natural result of it. And, and this idea that if you care about mentoring, it isn't that you don't care about research, it's that you actually care so much about research that you realize that the future of research depends on the training that we provide to the current you know, generation of early career researchers and that finding our way out of climate change and pandemics, um, addressing all of these needs is going to take everything we've got. And so that means we need to have the most diverse, most engaged, most well-equipped scientific workforce 
as possible into the future if we want to address these challenges and that that comes back to the mentoring we provide. And so, um, you know, anyone can go to mentorfirst.org and you can take the pledge or endorse the pledge. It, we have, you know, the idea is that we want to promote these best practices in mentoring, but we know that many of us were never trained to be good mentors and we want, and we're all busy and we want to make it as easy as possible for people. So we worked, collaborated with our research labs in, and ask them what would be important. You know, if, if faculty were going to pledge to do certain things to support grad students and postdocs and undergrads, what would be the important things you would want to see? And out of that uh, collaboration with our labs, we generated a list of commitments. And the goal is that people don't just sign the pledge and leave it there, but rather that you pick this up and bring it into your conversations. So if you're in a department or any other you know company where you are mentoring or working with early career researchers, that you consider getting together with your colleagues and saying, let's all take the pledge and let's meet for lunch a couple of times a year and talk about how we're doing on our mentoring, share stories, share tips, um, and help each other all get better at this. That was amazing. I love it. There, I, there are so many things that we have to talk about beyond this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we'll have to keep the conversation going. I mean, and that's the thing, I think that like your point of, that it's easy to sign something and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I, I get it. Like, of course, I'll go to this. But it's another thing to be accountable, but also then to be a recruiter and a champion of, of those. And, and like you said, just, just continue it and, and, and get more people involved. And something else that I thought of while you were, you know, talking about the sort of the, uh, the problems that you were addressing with this Mentor First initiative is also that the whole failure conversation we had that not just having a lab where people feel safe to, to be themselves, where they feel safe to fail and report that, because that's also something that would help, you know, stop scientific misconduct and also like just prevent, you know, things that are not true getting reported and not having people hide things. And I think that's something that, that certainly is, um, you know, my experience at companies is, is perceived as very positive that share your failure so that we know right away to address it, we don't yes. waste any money. And, and I think, yeah, just having the whole community say, it's, it's what, what can we learn from it? Because we will learn something. No matter what the failure is, we will learn something. But like you said, to be open. And yes. yeah. I love that. I completely agree. I think that that is, is key to really, you know, the scientific misconduct is driven yeah. by the reward structure mm -hmm. and it's driven by fear. And it's, we, we can't, we probably can't watchdog our way out of it as much as I do appreciate the people who are watchdogs for things like manipulated images. Um, that is so critical. I think about the work that Elizabeth Bick does, right? It's, it's so fantastic and so important to our field because we don't want to be wasting time trying to replicate things that, that weren't done at a high ethical standard. But in addition to that, we have to change the reward structure, that we have to reward failures. We have to, um, we have to make it so that people don't feel like their only choice is to do that. You know, nothing, nothing ever makes that okay. But if, if someone is in an environment with very unsupportive or even abusive mentoring um, and the reward structure of publishing, um, it puts early career researchers in very difficult situations. And I think we, we need a lot of systemic change to, yeah. to change that fact. Right. So we're coming up at the end and you, you were talking about systemic change. In the next, I always like to ask people sort of what yeah. are you hopeful for um, in the next you know, five years? And it doesn't have to be limited to one thing and, and, and it doesn't have to be limited just to what, what you were just talking about, about sort of a sea change, but in, in, in how we conduct research and, and treat failure and, and inclusivity but also um, in the field of PNAs. I'd love to know sort of those two areas, what you're most hopeful for. Oh, wow. Well, in the field of PNAs, I would love, I don't think this will happen, but I, if I could just wish anything mm -hmm. into being, yes. it would be a way to uh, just 
snap our fingers and molecularly 3D print any, uh, any PNA monomer or oligomer we want without having to go through all of the chemical synthesis uh -huh. um, or a highly, highly automated way to make these monomers because it's very labor intensive right now. And really it's our ability to synthesize monomers that limits what we can explore structurally at this point. So something that would make it just as easy to make PNA as it is to make DNA and RNA right now. On the academic culture side, I think it really, yeah, it circles back to changing the reward structure. I think that all of, you know, our, what gets rewarded gets repeated. What gets rewarded drives our behaviors. And if we want to see things like mentoring being, you know, being the norm, that good mentoring is the norm, then we need to keep increasing how we reward that. If we want, team science and collab huge open collaborations to be the norm in our field, then that needs to be rewarded. You know, creating an inclusive environment in your lab needs to be part of research excellence. And we need to really embed the things we value most in the metrics that we value most. And that's when we will create change the most effectively. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Exploration Science. As always, we welcome your feedback and suggestions for topics that you'd like to see covered. You can leave those suggestions in the comments below or tag us on LinkedIn. You can also find this podcast available as a YouTube series by searching Exploration Science. Thanks again for tuning in.